again because you've got better things to say than me anyway. Uh, I have a tough voice problem, but the, um, half my vocal cords are paralysed at the moment. Same thing happened to Larry Page and he was um, having good company. So if I'm a bit croaky, uh, it's not it's not for once the vet voice, it's that. And I'm going to start off with another bit of bad news, which is this rather dull graph. So um, it's a graph um, from the PISA data, uh, which is about the most boring thing I could possibly start with, except that here we got the science scores, and you know, who are the top nations in terms of science? There's Finland down here, uh, Netherlands, New Zealand, Canada, but you, know, you can see, I think, that it's a graph with two axes. X is across, Y is up, what's the other axis? And the other axis, of course, is you can just about see from the on the back, the other axis is whether the students are interested in science at all. And you can see a correlation, I mean, you don't need me to spell it out, between children who are uh, achieving the scores on the doors and children for whom the scores on the doors are bores, you know. So you've got a tough choice between wanting to be Mexico or Brazil, not knowing much but loving every minute of it, or being um, Canada, New Zealand, Finland, uh, Korea, uh, you know, achieving great understanding, but actually having your joy in science completely extinguished. And of course, we would all want to be up there, we'd all want to be up in that top right hand corner, it's in the top right hand corner, uh, who are the nations up here? Of course, absolutely nobody. So, it's a really interesting question, of, of why not and how do we get there? And, and for me, uh, and you'll know I've been saying this for long enough, the key part of this is to work with our learners, is to build that metacognition, that reflective practice indeed that was being, um, you know, being powerfully persuaded to come and hear from the students um, in this arena, and I'd say way more than that, I'd say unleash them as researchers. Looks interesting, I was just David Putnam's in the front row, we, were, we go back a long time, I was just chatting to him, he was with um, Bill Gates, interesting, you know, we go back to a young Bill Gates, here he is uh, as a school kid um, taking over, taking over designing the, um, the school admin system, and uh, he took it over because he wanted to put himself in a class with lots of pretty girls, you know, as a sort of thing you do as a teenager. But you know, at 17, he set up his first company. Or I could go. I'm particularly interested. On, Chris is a really lovely example. Apple employee number eight. He's still employed. Um, at Apple now. He would have actually been employee number four, but he, he was late arriving on that day because, of course, he was still at school. He was 14 year old, working for Apple at night, but had to finish school before he popped along. And, you know, you don't need me to pull out thousands more examples. Um, but why wouldn't we trust our youngsters? Why wouldn't we trust? Our learners, why wouldn't we trust our teenagers to build better learning? And of course we could, and of course we should, and that's what I'm about, you know. Um, let's jump back ten years. Ten years ago I got involved in a project with the, um, the World Bank, who said to me, Stephen, how do we measure learning? How do we know what good learning looks like? Um, well, you can't, I'm sure if I went around all of you now, you'd all have it's going to be a few hundred of you, it'll be a few hundred examples. Of course, some of the things would be, have you passed your exams? Can you read and write? But it's a bigger algorithm than that. And we were doing this with the World Bank, who at the time, their measure of learning success was one thing, how much have we spent? So if they spent twice as much learning, surely it must have been twice as good. How naive does he get? So, we thought we'd have a look at all that, and I had a, one of my postdoc students um, was set in the task of, pretty dull task really, was set in the task of going through politicians' speeches from all around the world and see what they were looking for from education. And it was pretty much everything, you know, they were looking for world peace, they were looking for kids who would argue more, they were looking for kids who would argue less, you know, they wanted everything. Uh, but they all wanted different things. We spent quite a lot of time trying to codify that, but that was a decade ago, and in that decade things have changed. 
I just jump back to, um, as I think a lot of you know, I don't work with um, the UK sport. I do work with the elite coaches for the Olympic effort, helping them with learning. And so it's interesting to contrast Olympics. Let's go back to Beijing for a moment. You remember fabulous finish to the Chinese Olympics, astonishing closing ceremony. And this sort of London bus came kind of rumbling in with David Beckham on top. It's, it's going to be quite good in London. He sort of miskicked kicked the ball off the bus in a rather endearing way, I thought. But if you look at the audience, of course, everybody in the, everybody in the audience has got a digital camera and they're all capturing their, their still images. Well, if I just jump on to, of course, this, this time round, I was lucky enough to be in the stadium. This is, um, this is Bolt, he's just won his gold medal for 200 metres. The stadium's, you know, in tumult. And four years later, as you can see, everybody in the audience is holding up their phone and shooting video. So, you know, four years we've gone from dedicated still camera to actually the thing in my pocket does everything I need in Judy video. You would ask questions, I think, about what the guys in the background are actually doing. They're the news media team, but, you know, as I took this picture, I'd already, I'd already shot my video, tweeted it, shared it around the world, it had gone viral, people were these guys are still going to get their video you know, back to the media centre. And I was actually asked to help redesign the media centre for the London Olympics and walked away from the task because it's just you don't need a media centre. The audience is immediately enable that, harness that, and you'll see something fabulous happen. Well, I'm just, just trying to signal that things have moved on. And if I just go to Big Data, let's look at a couple of examples. If you go to heaven.net slash Big Data, you'll find hundreds of these, but um, where should we go? Let's go. Look, I'm, a, I'm a sailor, so I'm going to go to this example. Here's a, here's a, this is a live map of, map of the world. Every single boat in the world that's moving is on this map now. So this is real time. It's about a three minute delay. So if I was to zoom in on uh, let's zoom in on where we are, perhaps. Um, you know, we're over here and sort of... These are the boats going up the, the river. And this is just, just a big one, a big that one maybe. And that's... Um, it's not a very exciting boat, to be honest. It's a barge. But crucially, it tells me... You know, <laughs> crucially, it tells me what it is, where it's going, how fast it's going, what its intention is, what its journey is, where it left from. And it's just interesting that we don't know any of that for our students. You know, if I was to click on a student on their way to school, I don't know how fast they're going to school, I don't know where they want to be at the end of the year, I don't know where they started off. If I'm a 13-year-old, you know, you're a 12-year-old, I don't know how good you are, I don't know that I need to go fast to keep ahead of you, I don't know how well my dad did when he was 12, I don't know any of that stuff. It seems extraordinary somehow that we're building learning on so little information. But of course, you an interesting debate about who would own the information? Who would share it? So um, we thought, let's start reflecting on empowering the students to look after their own information. Um, it's, well, let's go to an example. So one of the things we've been doing is asking the children to measure sound levels. You know, what are the components of good learning? Well, they're reasonably well documented for some things, and then they're very personal for others. We know that we need light levels. We need light levels of above 250 lux. You know, if we were working here in an office, we'd be expecting the light levels to be at 250 lux, and we just see what the light levels are at this moment. I bet they're lower than that. Um, so, uh, and for detailed work, we'd be looking at light levels of around about 500. So in here, flipping heck, I've got light levels of about 140 in here. So this room would be too dark for working, too dark for learning. So we've engaged children in building soundscapes and lightscapes of their school. What's the light like in the morning? What's the light like? Where are the noisiest places in your school? Where's, where's the sound? Is that sound loudest at 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 3 o'clock? It's noisy all day. And of course, the children are fascinated by 
all these components. Um, so here you see, you get my stand, you'll see students of Spain because these days, as you know, I'm a professor in UCJC in Madrid as well as in Fort Worth. And those children have been doing things like this to get their the lad here is standing on the stairwell. He's running this is just three decibel meter apps, so you can just download them for nothing. And he's standing there, he's sampling the sound level on the stairs. The stairwell is the noisiest place in the school by country mile. And the girls are walking up and down the stairs, videoing their feet with their tablets, looking to create the quietest way of walking. And they know quite quickly if they walk on their heels, it's loud. If they walk on tippy toes, it's quiet. So they're inventing better ways of quietening. If you were a teacher standing on the stairs saying to the children, be quiet, they never would. You give them the technology, metacognition, reflective task, reducing their sound levels, boy, do they go for it. And now, of course, a little raspberry pi to clip on the rail, the flash red, if you walk too noisily, how hard can it be? And they don't just stop there. So they noticed how noisy their chairs were when they moved them uh, in the classroom. Metal chairs on a hard floor. So um, here's me trying out their idea, which was... <laughs> That's pretty good, isn't it? It's pretty flipping good. Can we hear that again? I'm just, I'm just in awe of that, really. All they've done is stick a tennis ball on each leg. this stuff, you can imagine, saying to the kids, here's your school, here's your learning, sort it out. Um, and they're pretty much unstoppable. So um, what we've got going on in the stand at the moment, we've got kids who are measuring the light levels in their schools with their lux meter. You know, they're bashing their data all over the tables, of course. As you know, one of the things that's been transformed in our classrooms has been the furniture. Isn't it interesting? Who would have anticipated the telephones? To transform our furniture. You know, kids love to write on surfaces, they love to write on walls, they love to write on desks. They didn't used to be able to do it, but now of course they can capture everything they've written with. They're all carrying a camera, so they can capture what they're doing and uh, the phone has transformed the desktop. So here they are all working collaboratively, capturing their data, parking their data up into the cloud, it all goes into Google Docs in quite an exciting way. And we're then taking that data, and um, actually I can, sh I can show you where it's going. <laughs> Let's take a moment to um, stop it to Twitter for a moment. Yeah, in fact, here I can do this. I can do this as well. So if this is running live, of course, if you're tweeting, you know, you'll be up on the screen and say, so what we're doing on the stand is really quite interesting. We've, we've taken these LED strips they come out of the doors of the Ford Transit, actually. And we connected them up to a couple of little Arduino boards inside the cupboard. And the kids are capturing their data of their learning, parking it up in a Google Doc uh, in a spreadsheet. And we're, we're exploring their algorithm of learning, which turns out to be really interesting. So, and they'll be asking some of you to walk around what, you, what your variables would be. And some of the variables people... So if you're measuring great learning, you measure the light levels, you measure the sound levels, you measure the temperature, you measure the exam results, you measure all that, of course. But what else would you measure? People are suggesting you would measure how fast you come to school. I've got a phone just like the ships and knows how fast I'm going. Uh, so why don't I interrogate that? Interesting hypothesis. If your learning was great, would your children be running to school? Uh, we can measure their faces as they come through the gate. Uh, why wouldn't I just capture their faces? Maggie's smiling down here in the second row. If all the children are smiling when they arrive at school, my hypothesis might be it's good learning. Or maybe if they're smiling when they go home. Or maybe I'm interested in how late they stay at school. And then we're giving them a set of little semantic scales, little sliders, where they can make the judgment about, you know what, I'm not really enjoying this. Uh, I'm not stretched enough. It's not ambitious enough for me. Uh, I'm bored. And they're adjusting those little sliders. So, as a teacher, these LED strips on the back of your classroom, this is only prototype stuff, but it's indicative, I think, of where we might go with big data. As a teacher, I'm seeing the aggregate.
bits of my class sitting there looking at the ball and thinking, hang on a minute, it's all going a bit red, you know. Um, I, don't, I don't know why. I'm going, to have to, I'm going to have to start a conversation with the students. I'm going to have to say to my, my researchers, what's happening? Our algorithm says that learning's going down. And one of them might say, well, actually, Chief, look, it's the light. You turn the blasting projector on, you put the blinds down. We're all sitting in the dark, it's hateful. Or they might say, actually, Chief, we did all this last year, but doing it again is, is a bit of a, it's not much of a stretch. You know? So you force that dialogue off of metacognition, you force that dialogue of reflective practice on the kids from their data. We're also building a little badge so the kids can look at their own data and say, hang on, so as a teacher, you might look around the class and say, this lot over here, their badges have got red. There's something going wrong for them. Everybody else seems to be going well. So it's really, really interesting, this sense of what makes good learning and how granular it can be and of course fundamentally about who owns it and what they're going to do with it to improve their own learning. And we know how powerful that can be uh, from the peer support stuff. This is, I've got schools around the world I'm working as you know, these schools, and this is a wonderful Portland Academy down in